It is my absolute pleasure to introduce Srini Rao. He is the host of the Unmistakable Creative Podcast and an incredibly valued member of the MEM community, um, as well as a content creator, blogger, author. Um, and so over to him for today's webinar. Well, um, I think where I want to start is by asking uh, a question, and that is, uh, what do you do and how important is note taking to your job? Uh, you know, you can just put it in the chat uh, because I'm curious, you know, you know what role note taking plays in uh, all of your work. So um, I'm going to share my slides so we can get into all of that, but let's start with that first. Great. Um, so I really, uh, I think I started using MEM about three to four months ago. Uh, I was, you know, one of the early users. I had spent a lot of time looking at note taking tools. I started, you know, with Notion, which I still use. Then I learned about Rome which I loved conceptually, but the, out, the uh, interface was so clunky. And when I saw MEM, I thought, okay, great, this is gonna solve the problem because I am somebody who, as uh, <clears throat> Alex mentioned, writes a lot. Um, I've written two books as a publisher. I write blog posts on a weekly basis and I read more than a hundred books a year. And I, I wanted to get more out of all of the content that I was consuming because your consumption is one step, but it's what you do with the information that you consume that ultimately leads to real learning. So first I'll kind of give you an agenda in terms of you know, what I wanna talk about here today. Um, first off is you know, why do we take notes to begin with? And then talk about an insight that I had in the process of you know, starting to think about MEM as an idea factory instead of a note-taking app, which is this distinction between industrial era productivity and digital era productivity. And then I'll share a couple of key principles from my uh, way of looking at note taking inside of MEM. And then we'll talk about how to actually design an infrastructure that allows you to basically operate this idea factory. And then we'll talk about designing a workflow and I'll show you kind of how I work in MEM. And then I'll give you a couple examples uh, in terms of book notes and articles. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. So why would we take notes at all. Uh, first, we want to externalize information. Your brain is not a hard drive and it's a terrible place to store information. And uh, David Allen once said that your brain is for having ideas, not storing them. And the thing that happens when we externalize information is that we're able to do a lot more with it. So for example, when you externalize something as simple as notes from a book, you can then use those notes in articles that you wanna write. You can go back to them for insights. You can do all sorts of different things with them. You can combine them together. Uh, you can capture new ideas. That's a huge part of why taking notes is so important. Uh, and nobody has a shortage of ideas. You know, People always say, I have writer's block and saying that you have writer's block is like saying you have a blockage of thoughts. Nobody has a shortage of thoughts, so there's no way they have a shortage of words they can write about. The problem is we tend to judge our ideas. And this is something that I realized after 10 years of writing is that you should never judge the validity of an idea the moment you come up with it because often an idea that sounds awful today becomes brilliant tomorrow. Some of you know, you've probably experienced this where you write down something and you think to yourself, well, that's stupid. And then you go back the next day and you think, wow, that's the most profound insight I've ever had. And then the opposite is true as well, where you think you have this brilliant idea, you wake up the next morning and you think to yourself, well, that was idiotic. Why did I have that idea? And by externalizing information and capturing ideas, you're able to maximize your creative output because unless you capture an idea, you can't capitalize on it. And this is something that I see a lot with writers and bloggers uh, who are the primary members of my community. Uh, and they often struggle to be consistent with their creative output or with a blog. And one of the keys to that is simply having an editorial calendar where you capture ideas, even if those ideas are half-baked because no ideas really show up fully formed, which is what I think makes MEM so powerful. But let me share an example of what can happen just from a note. You can actually build a career off of one note. So somebody who I know really well uh, and has really emphasized this whole idea of note-taking, wrote eight books in eight years, has three New York Times bestsellers on the list simultaneously. And for those of you who know anything about publishing, having one book on the New York Times bestseller list is incredibly difficult. And one of his books sold more than a million copies. 
And in case you're wondering who I'm talking about, uh, this is Ryan Holiday. Uh, I'm sure you're probably familiar with his work because it's wildly popular at this point. So Ryan and I uh, both have the same publisher. And when he wrote one of his books, I asked him about this note-taking system that you've probably heard about. Uh, he's written about it in, uh, elsewhere called the note card system. And Ryan learned this system from Robert Greene. And if you've ever read a Robert Greene book, Robert Greene is basically the James Cameron of publishing. He writes one book every 10 years and it becomes a New York Times bestseller. And I asked Ryan about this note card method uh, that he talked about. And he said, most of these notes lead to nothing, but one of them is enough to build a career off of. So he wrote down a note with the idea for his book, The Obstacle is the Way, four years before he wrote that book. That book went on to sell a million copies three years after it came out. And now Ryan basically has built a career. And I believe that taking notes actually is a vital part of his workflow that has allowed him to be as prolific as he is. So one fundamental idea that I think is really important here comes from the work of Sanka Ahrens. And for those of you who haven't uh, watched his lecture that he gave at a software development conference on how to take smart notes or read the book, How to Take Smart Notes, I highly, highly recommend it because I think that that book really could just as easily be an instruction manual for men. It's one of those things that I now consider required reading for good note taking. And so that kind of takes us to what I consider the key principles for my mem note-taking strategy. The first one being, just like every intellectual endeavor begins with a note, every new idea begins with a mem. As I said before, you don't want to judge your ideas when you capture them because ideas take time to bake. And sometimes you'll have ideas that you have nothing to say about and you can just create a mem and always come back to that idea because it shows up in your timeline. And I think that's one of the really beautiful things about the way that mem is set up and structured is the fact that you are never at a loss for ideas and you can just capture ideas endlessly, even if you don't necessarily know what you're going to do with that idea. The other thing that I realized in the process of using MEM more and more is that your brain is a network, not a hierarchy. So if you look at standard note-taking approaches, standard note-taking tools, and, and just standard ways of organizing information, the way that people organize information is in hierarchies. They create you know, Dropbox folders and subfolders and subfolders. Uh, even in an app like Notion, you create pages and subpages and more subpages. And what you probably noticed is that that becomes really difficult uh, when you're trying to organize your information or when you're trying to find anything. And the reality is that that's a linear approach to organizing information. The problem is that that's actually not the way that your brain works. Your brain is a hierarchy filled with all sorts of connections. So just to, to give you an example, let's say that you hear a particular song. Anytime you hear that song, it triggers a memory of something that you associate with that song. So, uh, you know, I was on my seventh grade basketball team where I was the most improved player, which just means you're the shittiest player on the team. Uh, and the final season, uh, or, or the, for the final game of our season, our coach played the Van Halen song Jump, which, you know, for those of you who are too young to know what the hell Van Halen is or Jump, just go look it up on Spotify. So anytime I hear that song, it triggers a memory of that experience. And so there are a lot of things that work like that. And so anytime you have one idea, you almost always in your brain associate it or connect it with another idea. And that's where I think memory really shines is, you know, being able to take advantage of the fact that your brain is a network, because uh, as you know, Alex and I were talking earlier, right before we got on here, she was saying, you know, with each individual mem you create, the network of notes that you created becomes more and more valuable because of the fact that you are, you know, creating all these different connections in a lot of ways this method to note taking is the equivalent of uploading your brain to the internet without sort of, you know, having Tony Stark level capabilities and, you know, Jarvis capabilities. And then, you know, the final one is this idea that you have to capture ideas in order to capitalize on them. Uh, the thing is, nobody has any shortage of ideas, you know, like, Every one of us has ideas when we're driving, when we're in the shower, you know, we want to write a blog post, we might have an idea for a business. When you think about it, you have all sorts of ideas every single day. And so this is really one of the key components to this. And the thing is, it doesn't matter if the idea is half-baked, it doesn't matter if the idea is any good. All that matters is that you capture this. So before we go on, I want to just pause real quick and see if there are any questions. Um, and also, you know, open this up, uh, you know, one of the questions I asked before was, you know, how important is note taking to your job? Uh, you know, and, and what do you do for work? And, you know, how are you currently taking notes? And, you know, if anybody wants to volunteer to come on camera, cool. Or if you want to just put it in the chat, go for it. And if not, I'm happy to continue.
Cool, Sundar. Uh, yeah, actually, honestly, uh, note taking on my job is not that important um, mm -hmm. because we have. Uh, so I'm a so I'm Sundar, and I work as a software engineer. So we have various tools that are set in place uh, uh, at our uh, at our company where uh, note taking essentially doesn't mean that you're taking it personally. It's more like mm -hmm. officially docs and all of those that is shareable within the company network and things like that. Uh, but what I've recently started doing is like when I go through articles that talk about a certain technology or a certain hack or a certain uh, deviation from a normal pattern and things like that, uh, I consume and then I've lost that thought somewhere back in my brain, which then triggers later at a conversation with my colleague. So mm -hmm. I'm trying to reduce that to say that at any given point, when I'm in a conversation with my colleague, I can always go back to refer some point on like w a, a word or a tag or based search that I can do. So that's where like I started looking into Rome and then I ended up now in uh, Meh. Yeah. Uh, so that's where I'm generating the importance of note taking, if I must say. Uh, currently, it is not that important to me, but I'm trying to generate that importance. Yeah, I think that you 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 know um, hit up on something really important. You know, there's no short of inf edge of information that we're consuming. You know, between the articles we read, the podcasts we listen to, books we we read, you know, videos we watch, and often what ends up happening is you know, you have this sort of excessive consumption in which you don't separate the signal from the noise. So you don't get this key point. And that's you know where I think a feature like Mem Spotlight really comes in, where you can say, okay, let me take this one little nugget that I got, capture it inside of my Mem database, give it a tag. And you know I'll show you a couple of examples when we get into um, you know sort of my actual uh, Mem database. But yeah, I mean, I think that that's super valuable because the other thing that's really important here is that it's not just capturing information, but also you know, understanding the context of that information because every piece of information can be applied in different contexts and the context that you apply it in will actually determine the results. And this is something that I learned in, you know, looking back, it's something I recognize. So for example, um, you know, you know, Alex goes to Stanford. So chances are she was a straight A student in high school and anybody who goes to any types of these schools typically is, right? The funny thing though is you don't really have to be smart to be a straight A student in high school. You have to be disciplined. It's when you get to college, you start to realize that, wait a minute, intelligence in high school is an indication of discipline. Real intelligence college in college is an indication of learning. And I was looking back at, you know, taking economics midterms and how typically when you don't understand note taking, what do we do? We highlight, you know, underlying passages. Like I remember seeing, you know, notebooks at Berkeley, people highlighted the entire damn textbook. It was like, are you really going to, you know, export the textbook on a midterm? But then where your understanding is really put to the test is then you get in and they, you know, no matter how many equations you solve and no matter how many problem sets you do, the moment you show up in a midterm, they present that information in a completely different context. And so suddenly you're either come to the realization that, wait, I don't actually understand this as well as I thought I did, or you realize that, okay, because of the way that I've taken notes and, you know, paraphrase things in my own words, uh, you know, I understood that elaboration is a critical part of this. And so you end up actually, um, you know, being able to, it, you know, actually learn something as opposed to, you know, me who got a C minus on economics at Berkeley. So that's, you know, that was my huge takeaway when I, I kind of started to really understand note taking and, you know, when, in terms of how you're talking about it. Um, yeah, Zach also asked a question. Zach, do you want to um, just top on screen? Yeah, totally. I'd love to. Uh, so I'm just learning about MEM. So I'm like way lame to the party here. I just got access this morning. Um, been playing with it a little bit, but I'm an accountant. And so I have the opposite mm. of our software friend where every meeting I go into, I need detailed notes. I need to know what we're committing to do, um, what we need to do to make things happen. Um, and mm. so, and then I need to be able to distill that to my team. I may assign a project with some notes I know, and my team member is is remotely dispersed, and I need to share that quickly and efficiently with them. So I'm excited to see what Mem can do in that front. Um, ho hopefully, that kind of cool. answers the question. Or, yeah, no, absolutely does. All when we discussion. when we get into you know how I've set up Mem, well, I'll actually show you exactly how to do that for meeting notes as well. So, um, well, let me continue with the slides so we can talk a little bit about sort of you know how productivity in the industrial era differs from productivity in the digital era. So in the industrial era, you know, productivity typically was a combination of raw materials, labor, and output. 
you know, it basically works in a linear fashion. You know, you have these raw materials that go into the factory. So for example, let's just say we're making shoes, right? So one person's job is to basically, um, you know, stitch the leather. Another person's is to put the laces together. Another person's is to paint the shoes or give it the color that you need. And at the end of the assembly line, what you get is output. Well, the thing in the digital era is that an assembly line is more like a hub and spoke model than an assembly line, right? Because we have ideas, we have thoughts, we have insights, and you know, all of it basically comes from you, the content you consume. And so the output basically um, is the result of you know, whatever you do, whether it's reading, writing, software programming, whatever it is. But the thing is, the way that the input comes in isn't linear. Uh, simply because of the fact that we're not actually making widgets, we're now creating knowledge. Uh, you know, we're creating information. So in the digital era, the assembly line product for productivity looks completely different than the way it does in the industrial era. So one thing that I, I think is really important to understand is this concept of division of labor. Uh, if you, you know, go back and you read The Wealth of Nations by Adam Smith, one of the, the core ideas between it is uh, of that book is that you know the division of labor is the key to maximizing output and one thing that a lot of people don't realize is that even if they're sole entrepreneurs or like a one man or one woman show they are still actually dividing labor but the difference nowadays instead of dividing labor between just people we're dividing labor between people and technology so let's just take the example of something as simple as a website right you have a hosting provider that provides hosting you have a cms that allows you to actually create the content and then you know you have you know creators who are the labor and then you have the actual content which is the output so basically what's happening is you're dividing labor between people and technology now in the context of your idea factory inside of mem mem as a service or as an app is the technology writing is the labor and then your notes are the raw materials. So every mem basically becomes uh, a part of the raw materials. And so when you start to assemble these mems together, you end up with your output, which basically becomes the output of your idea factory. So let's talk a little bit about the infrastructure of your idea factory, and then we'll actually go into this because I think the key to really maximizing output inside of mem is having a way that you interact and organize with information, way that you interact with and organize information, which is the infrastructure, and then also a, a workflow, which is really kind of your labor. So uh, some of you who are familiar with knowledge management might be familiar with this framework that comes from my friend Tiago Forte, uh, who uh, has a course called Building a Second Brain. And Tiago probably is one of the most knowledgeable people I know when it comes to knowledge management. Um, he has really spent a lot of time thinking about this and he's actually you know, writing a book about this. I know this because I, I introduced him to my literary agent specifically because I want him to write the book for me so I can read it. But um, you know, one of the things that happens for a lot of people is their biggest issue when it comes to productivity is that the way they organize information is just a giant mess. There's no structure to it. So, you know, a lot of people, if you look at the way they work, they basically have hundreds of folders. I mean, how many of you have those desktops where you look at it and it's just like just chaos on your actual computer desktop? Uh, or you can never find anything inside of, you know, whatever software you're using because it's just so disorganized. And by having a framework like this, you basically end up being able to know where everything is at. So, you know, for the sake of definitions, projects are basically things that have a end or a defined timeline. So for example, right now I'm working on this course called Maximum Output with MEM. That's a project because at some point it'll be done. Uh, an area of responsibility for me is writing because that's not something that I'm you know, going to do all the time or, or that's something I am doing all the time. So I write blog posts or write sales pages. So writing ends up becoming an area of responsibility. Resources um, are, are book notes, are notes from podcasts or notes from meetings like Zach was mentioning. And then archives are basically things that are done. And I think it's important to archive things because there's always stuff competing for your attention. And one of the keys to effective attention management is to reduce the number of things that are competing for your attention. And that's why I think it's important to archive uh, you know, different things once you're done with them. So then I want to talk briefly about workflow and we'll actually go into an example of this. So the workflow for what I call an idea factory in MEM is based on the work of Sanka Ahrens, who I referenced earlier. Um, he wrote a book called How to Take Smart Notes and How to Take Smart Notes was actually based on the work of a social scientist named Nicholas Luhmann. Nicholas Luhmann in his lifetime published 30 books, wrote 500 papers and finished a PhD within a year. And I'm curious, does anybody here actually have a PhD or anybody in academic? Uh, 
because the idea that anybody could finish a PhD in a year is absurd. It sounds insane. I know this because my dad's a college professor. And I think that, you know, when you hear that, you think to yourself, wait a minute, on average, somebody completes a PhD in about four years. If they're lucky, that's yeah. fast. So when I saw this, I thought this is a, I have to know more about this. And the more time that I spent actually working with this idea, the more valuable MEM became. So what I'm going to do now is um, I'm going to go into a couple of different examples. Um, the first is going to be taking book notes in MEM, and then we'll talk about writing articles in MEM. So I'm going to um, switch from the slides, and I'm going to share a different screen here. All right. Um, let me know and make sure you can see my MEM database. Okay, cool. So you should be seeing MEM right now. So. Um, I'll walk through a, a couple of different examples here, um, and the first is is you know what we call designing infrastructure, and that really goes to this whole idea of projects, uh, areas of responsibility, and resources. So the way I set this up, and I actually wrote about this in detail in the article that I just published today about note taking strategy on Medium. So I have different pages for each one of these. So I have a projects page. So if we go here, you'll see these are all the various projects that I'm working on right at the moment. And inside of each project, I think this is probably a you know, good example. So for example, I have references inside of a project. Um, I have tasks inside of a project. I the way I like to organize this, when I first started doing this, I was creating separate MEMS for the task pages and separate MEMS for the reference pages, and it just got really confusing. But um, Zach, to your point, you know, when you talk about meeting notes, one of the things that's really nice about the way that MEM organizes information, so if you, for example, had notes for a meeting, you could have all your notes here, and you could have all your tasks, and the nice thing is you'll see all the tasks for that particular meeting show up here in the tasks timeline. So that makes this really great for one, you know, working on multiple projects simultaneously without interrupting your workflow. So the next piece of this basically is areas of responsibility. And you can see here, I have a bunch of different areas of responsibility. I have one different mem for each one of the areas of responsibility. So for example, if, you know, it's an email newsletter, I'm just like, okay, send, you know, an email newsletter. Um, I might, you know, for example, have resources inside of there as well. Uh, when it comes to projects, I tend to basically have an overview on one page, you know, one mem, um, tasks on that same mem, and then any references I put into separate rooms because sometimes references get really long. So you don't want to clutter up a page with a bunch of stuff. Uh, you know, so for example, if we have copywriting updates, for example, I could have references to a copywriting course or books that I've read on copywriting. And if I actually put all the content from the references into here, it becomes unnecessarily messy. So that's how I recommend setting up, you know, projects and areas of responsibility. And then finally, you know, we have resources, which tend to be primarily for me, as far as resources go, uh, it's primarily book notes, right? You can see here, you know, I also have notes from online courses that I've taken. I haven't actually created a book notes page because I have so many book notes in here. Mm -hmm. um, but you can see here, you know, for example, this is just a reference note or uh, notes on, you know, the Natalie Lason's SEO course. So I have all the various notes um, that I've taken in one section on my resources. So that way, any resources that you have are actually right there at your fingertips. And you know, the other thing is because of the fact that we can use tagging inside of MEM, uh, everything that I have ever written about SEO or any note that I've taken about SEO ends up showing up here uh, or anything that even mentions it. So that is the sort of the, the basic way to structure this. Um, so Zach, you know, you had asked earlier about meetings. So for example, right now, we can create a MEM for this meeting that we're in. And you know any questions you guys have, for example, I could put here, I could take notes on this, I could add a transcript to this meeting. And then if I add, you know, for example, any tasks here, um, you know, follow with Zach, for example. If I go here, you can see here, basically, from that one meeting, I can see all the tasks that are associated with it. So let's now go into um, creating a you know, book notes inside of MEM, because this is one of the things that I primarily use MEM for, but book notes done the right way tend to be something that, you know, really maximizes your creative output. So um, I already set this up in advance just so we wouldn't have to waste a ton of time. Uh, so inside the smart notes system that Sonk Aaron's created, the whole point of taking smart notes is to one, you know, enhance your understanding of the material you consume, uh, be able to explain it in your own words, because 
one of the things that you start to realize when you go through this process is that you don't really understand something unless you can explain it in your own words. Uh, so in this case, for example, we have reference notes and reference notes are basically the uh, original source material. So in this case, these are all the various quotes and highlights that I took from writer Carroll's book, The Bullet Journal Method. Now, let's just take uh, you know one literature note and as, and as an example. So literature notes are your way of paraphrasing uh, whatever it is that you know, you had an insight on. So for example, right here, um, he basically says, you know, when you open a notebook, you automatically unplug. So the way that I set up literature notes, so let me actually go back and copy that highlight really quick. And you can also copy these highlights using Mem Spotlight as well. So in this case, for example, you know, my primary note here is writing a notebook, writing in a notebook forces you to unplug. Um, and then I could, for example, say writing in a notebook is distraction free by default. When you write in a notebook, it gives you time to pause and reflect. And this is actually one of the biggest insights I had recently when you know I said you could use bi-directional links to overcome writer's block. And so let's just say that I wanted to, for example, have a permanent note. Now, a permanent note is different than a literature note. So the other thing that I do here is I create uh, a template. So I use you know, the flows inside of Mem to just add this, and then I can link this to the original source here. So that way, you know, I basically can tag it. I have you know, a link to the original source. But let's say that I wanted to have a permanent note that is just my own insight where you basically are able to understand you know, what this is about without having to refer to the original source. So for example, I could say writing in a notebook makes you a better writer. And one of the things, let's just say, helps me write better. I think there's a character limitation if I remember that I keep running to. Okay, so the thing is I can make this note now and I don't have anything to say about that right now, but the thing is because I captured it through a bi-directional link, that note will be in my timeline. And let's say by the time I wake up tomorrow morning, I have an idea about it. I can actually fill that in. And now suddenly I have you know what are called permanent notes, which are my own insights from uh, basically, you know, doing this. So here's another one, for example, I filled this in beforehand. Uh, this is something I've said before, so I just, you know, put it in there as a note, but I could, for example, you know, create this permanent note. And so somebody could go to this note and they could read this note and make sense of it. So one other thing that you want to do is to take these notes in such a way that you're thinking on behalf of your future self, right? So that when you come to these notes in the future, they actually make some sense to you. Like it's not just a bunch of gibberish. And that's why it's really important to the way you tag this also, you know, matters here. So one thing that uh, people tend to do, and, and I do this as well, and it's not the best habit, but we tend to tag by topic as opposed to tagging by whatever our need for discoverability is, you know, so for example, instead of tagging this as notebooks, I could actually say, you know, why notebook, why writing in notebooks is great or something like that. Why you should write in a notebook should, could be the tag. And so that way I know what this is actually about as opposed to notebooks, which is kind of vague. Um, and so, you know, for example, if I wanted to write an article on notebooks, I could actually just go back to that. Um, so that's how we take book notes. So let's talk now briefly about how to actually write an article inside of Mem using all these different notes. So a couple of key concepts that you should know when it comes to writing in general. This was the thing that unlocked the ability to go from writing blogs to writing books. So a lot of people struggle with the transition from blogger to author because you know when you're writing a blog, you can write about one thing today, another thing next week. But then when you actually write a book, you have to talk about the same topic for 200 pages. Uh, you know, I worked with a writing coach in the process of writing my book and anytime I would start to meander, she would say, what does this have to do with the concept to be unmistakable to the point where I started to hate the word unmistakable, uh, even though it's literally the company I you know, built our, our company around, the word I built a company around. But she had a good point. Now, the thing that people struggle with is that they think that structure has to be linear. Uh, you know, which it does, but they think that, that just because a structure is linear, that the process of writing has to be. So that's the result of how we've been conditioned to write. Because if you think back to sort of your early education, how did we learn to write? 
we learn to write five paragraph essays where we write an outline, we you know fill in the blanks, but there's no such thing as the great American five paragraph essay for a reason, because in school you write in order to pass tests and get good grades, but in life you write in order to be read. And to do that, your structure needs to be linear, but your process doesn't. So often, one thing that a lot of people don't know is that an author will write an entire book and then they'll write the introduction after they finish writing the book because they don't even know what's going to be in the book. And so what this allows you to do is to have insight without necessarily taking immediate action on it, just like we did with you know bi-directional linking. Another idea, this is something that you know I think James Altucher really coined this idea of idea sex, right? Because different ideas interact with each other and then you have new ideas which are the offspring of you know idea sex. So let's say, for example, in this case, um, you know, I basically pulled up the tag decision making. So, um, you know, I can basically say, okay, I've got all these different notes on decision making. And if I wanted to, I could actually say, you know, let's do this. So I can just start adding all of these different, uh, you know, mems into this one thing. Now, of course, the order is going to be all out of whack. And that's where the real work comes in. But you know, instead of being having to start from scratch with, you know, an outline that you work on, where it's like, hey, here's the introduction, here's the conclusion, all that. Instead of this sort of top down approach, you take a bottom up approach. And so ultimately, what ends up happening is you're able to write in the way that your brain actually thinks, because typically, you know, even if you if you write regularly, you don't write everything in a linear order, you might have like one insight on an idea today, you know, one insight, you know, tomorrow. So for example, you know, I have all these different things that I have, you know, taken notes on. So let's just, you know, pull another one in here using mem spotlight. And you know, some of these are, you know, literature notes, some of these are permanent notes. Uh, and you can see here, they're also linked again. So that's why having this network of notes basically starts to turn your mem database into an idea factory because you're never starting from scratch. You have just this abundance of notes. There's connections between all of them. And so that way, so for example, let's say I wake up tomorrow morning and I'm like, oh, I don't have any new ideas to write about. Well, I have basically so many different mems in here that actually don't have anything filled in that tomorrow morning I can just wake up and start filling one of them in and that's the end of writer's block as we know it. You're basically not starting from scratch. And so that really is, um, you know, the basic overview of how I've been using MEM and, and really kind of came up with this concept of, you know, using MEM as an idea factory. But uh, I, I'd really love to open this up to, to questions and, you know, kind of hear from you guys, you know, what are you struggling with? Uh, because, you know, we're working on, uh, I'm working on a, a course called Maximum Output with MEM. And, you know, I definitely want to make sure that it actually solves the problems that people have. So I'm curious, you know, what are the big challenges that you guys have? And, you know, I have a survey too that I'll, I'll add to this as well. Um, I think, Alex, you probably have the link to the survey, if, um, of which I believe you said you were going to send out. So, uh, yeah, I'd love to open it up to questions. Greg? Yeah, thanks. Uh, this is helpful. This is fascinating. Good stuff. Um, the um, So how do you deal with – I capture a lot of stuff with audio. Then mm -hmm. I go back later and I go, what the hell is the audio about? Um, and I want to, I don't know, weed through it. Um, but how do you, how do you handle that first, that first mile of, from thought to thing, you know, to make sure that you, that you capture that thing on the fly and then yeah. move on. Yeah. I mean, I think that that's, you know, where, um, this whole idea, there's a couple of different ways you can do that. So, you know, for example, we're just using bi-directional links, right? So that's like one example of capturing a thought, you know, without having to take immediate action on it. That was like my big sort of aha moment of why network linking was so powerful. Uh, because I heard the concept, I read about it, you know, and then when I finally just was one day, you know, typing in mem and I was like, Oh my God, I was like, this is it. This is why this is so valuable. So that's one thing. Audio is one of the most, most challenging, you know, mediums in which to capture information. I only know this because I've spent 10 years producing audio. And, you know, I always joke that if I could be, actually implement the advice of my podcast guests, I'd be a billionaire with six pack abs and a harem of supermodels. And I'm none of those things. So, um, you know, one thing with audio is, is, you know, transcription. I tend to like text because of the fact that it's searchable. That's one, one of the things that makes audio challenging is the fact that it's not searchable. Um, but there are a couple of apps, um, you know, and I'm, I'm guessing at some point Mem will integrate with them. There's a, a podcast app called Air. Uh, and I actually learned about Air from Nat Eliason's Rome Effortless Output course because 
you know, typically the way, you know, we were taking podcast notes, one, nobody had done a good job of creating a podcast app that allows you to take good notes. And Air basically allows you to, for example, let's say you hear an insight on a podcast and if you have AirPods, you can literally just triple tap and it'll capture that highlight. And not only that, you can request a transcript and then you can export those highlights. And I believe using the Mem API, um, which I don't know how to do yet, <laughs> um, but you could probably recreate it in such a way so that those highlights automatically get imported into your mem database. So that's the way I would deal with audio. Uh, um, two thoughts to that. One is um, AIR, A-I-R, and that's a, is that, is that oh, right? Oh, uh, yeah. Let me, let me actually pull it up for you. It's, um, and then you're saying, that, so it, it's not a transcription service, but it, it does like, uh, it just captures before and after. Uh, well, so, so you can you can actually log into the app. So when you're listening, they have a feature to request a transcript, and it'll give you a full transcript. And then, you know, for example, so I usually what I do when I'm listening on air is I try and scribe everything beforehand before I listen. So that way, you know, when I triple tap on something or save a highlight, it'll actually basically have the text with that highlight automatically. And so then you can you can share those highlights publicly. You can, you know, import them into your mem database, you know, whatever your note taking app of choice is. Um, so I think that that like and I, you know, I, I didn't switch podcast listening apps for 10 years and I've been producing a podcast for 10 years. When these guys came along, I was like, this is a problem that nobody has been able to solve and they finally managed to do it. So and do you then do you is this what you also use to capture your own audio notes or you use something else? Um, well, I typically, I'm kind of a weirdo in that I, despite producing a podcast, audio is my least preferred form of media consumption. Like I hardly listen to podcasts. Um, I like reading books a lot more because I'm way too ADD for, you know, something as long as a podcast, which is strange coming from a guy who produces a one hour podcast twice a week. Um, but yeah, I mean, I just, I feel my retention is a lot higher um, in written content, but you know, some people like audio. And so, you know, if you're somebody who does and you want to be able to access the the knowledge that you capture from audio, Air is a really good way to do it. Thank you. Cool. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Anybody else? Well, I, I'm. I'd be. Yeah, it's in there. Uh, yeah. Um... Uh, I, I I have to take off, but I just want to share uh, that how great uh, it was to actually listen uh, to you go over the workflow. I've seen, I, I read the article that came out today and I'm interested in more videos. And uh, and I think like in the in the first webinar, I had shared some feedback uh, with Alex as well that I'm hoping to uh, see the product evolve. And, uh, um, and yeah, I, I'm super stoked for what's coming up uh, in MEM. And uh, I know that uh, the API has been out and I'm trying to get my hands on uh, in my spare time to build something that, that I can uh, uh, lay the uh, road forward for like API-based development there. Um, okay. The one thing that, that would be great uh, overall, I don't know what other, uh, what you people think is that uh, any sort of like notes integration, like for me sometimes, uh, I feel like when I'm listening to podcasts or when I'm listening to like, uh, let's say an, an, an audio book that's on YouTube, sort of a thing that I just played on another tab, uh, is sometimes I like to use either my pen uh, or, or, or uh, uh, the iPad to actually write down uh, what, what I would want to register in my head rather than to type it out, be it Mem or Rome or Notion or anything for that matter. Uh, mm -hmm. But Lot, now I have deviated to like two different forms of my uh, 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 the information that I would like to keep it in one place. Uh, so in which like if there is some sort of a way where I could import all my handwritten notes somewhere else uh, into yeah. mem uh, in one way or the other, then I don't have to worry about at a later point, I could make it all into a, a typed text or like maybe I don't need my handwriting is good enough for me to actually uh, understand. Yeah. Well, so the, the funny thing, so th this is one of the reasons, like for me, my handwriting is atrocious. It's like barely legible. Like I go back and even though I write in a notebook and, you know, pretty much write three pages of notebook every day, half the time I can't even understand what the hell it says. Uh, but if your handwriting is good, then, you know, apps like Readwise have um, OCR capabilities where you can actually just create, you know, for example, a custom, you know, book in Readwise and basically take all your notes from your notebook. But your handwriting has to be good. Mine sucks, so I can't do that. <laughs> yeah, um, mine sucks too. I, 
I think like everyone feels that way about their handwriting, however good it is or however bad it is. But uh, no. uh, but yeah, uh, thanks. It was nice uh, uh, talking and listening to you. Uh, and uh, uh, see you all. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I, I'd be curious, um, you know, just as, as I'm going up, you know, building the course material, what have you guys found difficult or challenging? Like what are the big challenges that you guys have had, uh, you know, with them? Just feel free to answer in the comments. Uh, Anna. Oh. Hi, I'm a I'm a new mem user. Um, just kind of, I've had it for a while, but just kind of getting started on it. One thing I'm kind of struggling with, and I think our, what you, you've already shared has been really helpful, kind of how you organize like the projects, the areas, and things like that, which I, I really like. I'm excited to implement is um, just keeping track of my tags. I'm starting to double tag things. I'm starting to yeah. use them differently. So kind of, I think being a little more systematic in how I tag, so I can start to get the benefit of those related mems. Yeah, so I, I think that's that's one of those that, I mean, like I said, even for me, that's a challenge. But one sort of idea, you know, you remember when we were talking about, you know, notebooks, like, you know, why you should use notebooks. So one thing Sankar Aarons talks about, if you read the Smart Notes book, it'll probably help you solve that problem. Uh, but he talked about the idea of, you know, sort of this distinction between thinking like a writer and thinking like an archivist. And the way that most people tag notes is they think like archivists, right? Whereas if you're thinking like a writer, you're acting on behalf of your future self. You're like, okay, how do I tag? So really what I would say is if you're thinking about tagging systems, it's like, how do I tag this note in such a way that I could discover it, you know, tagging for discoverability rather than necessarily by topic. I mean, and you know, that both those could be both the one and the same too. But yeah, if you, I, I would, you know, like I said, I, I mean, I, at this point to me, how to take smart notes, which you know, is um, this book right here, uh, I think is pretty much the Bible on note taking. Like I've, you know, I've yet to see anything this good in 10 years of, of you know, writing and creating content. Okay, yeah, so Steve, you. yeah, so Steve just mentioned, you know, using Mem as an idea gen engine for newsletter curation. Um, and that, you know, that absolutely is possible, right? Because let's just say, for example, you wanted to create a newsletter, uh, you know, of a bunch of different stuff. And I'll, I'll give you an example, you know, so I just started kind of talking to this girl and, you know, our common bond is music. And so I was like, oh, you know, one of the things I want to do is make, a, you know, a, like photo book of music lyrics. And so I literally just captured all the music lyrics inside of my mem database. And now I'm just going to go back and put it together. And what would have normally taken me, you know, months, I'm probably going to be able to finish in a matter of hours. Um, so that's, you know, one thing is just by using tagging. Uh, so for example, let's just say, you know, we, we call it Steve DeLong's newsletter. If Steve captured a bunch of things from the internet, you know, articles, whatever, using Mem Spotlight, and he tagged them as Steve DeLong's newsletter, he literally could just go to that tag, put all of those things together through Mem Spotlight, and in a matter of, you know, five minutes, he'd have a whole newsletter written. Um, Zach, that's probably a, a question for the MEM team as far as offline mode. Could you explain that tagging concept? Either, yeah, yes, I didn't quite that. All right, why don't, me, I didn't follow. Let me, let, let me, let me just, you know, do this as an example. Um, I'll share my screen with you. Okay, so, um, you know, so what I was saying basically is that, um, for example, I wanted to create this, you know, book of the various music lyrics on this shared playlist that, you know, I have with this girl. And so I basically created one mem titled, you know, book of music lyrics, but you can see here, because I tagged all of these different lyrics, um, you know, as book of music lyrics, I don't have to go searching for them. They're all right there. So that way, you know, for example, you know, we're talking about Steve. So if this was basically instead of book of music lyrics, every little thing, you know, Steve captured was tagged, um, you know, Steve DeLong's newsletter, then he literally could just go here, see all the various related items, and then, you know, just compile them into the newsletter. And, you know, for example, you could just use Mem Spotlight. You wouldn't even have to, you know, go there. But the fact that they're all linked there, uh, you know, makes that even easier. Does that make sense, Greg? Uh, the hypothetically, yes. I'll, I wouldn't know how to execute it. Is, is this? Is there? Is, is what is the parallel? Because I was I use a lot of the of of wiki stuff back when mm -hmm. wiki stuff was first starting. Is there a parallel here that I'm missing? That I'm seeing that that in terms of the bi-directional links made me think of of the wiki. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I I was never a big wiki user, so I you know uh, you def- my my answer probably lacks context. So um, yes and no. I mean, I've heard people say that it's not exactly like what Wikipedia uh, database because I, I that and I don't exactly know how to explain it. Um, Song okay. Aaron's actually talks about that in the Smart Notes lecture that he gives. Uh, you know what the difference is uh but i I think that this is more like a a network of just thoughts you know because you know wiki basically is topic focused whereas this basically is it's the equivalent of uploading your brain to the internet the way i think about it cool thank you yeah cool um anybody else Great. Uh, Alex, do you have any closing remarks? Thank you all for joining us. Um, and a huge round of applause for Srini. Uh, please check out the Slack for um, Srini's incredible tutorial videos, as well as keep an eye out for his upcoming MEM course about how to optimize output with MEM, or how to maximize output with MEM, excuse me. And if you'd like to follow Srini, um, at his un- Unmistakable Creative podcast. Feel free to visit the link I sent in the chat, podcast.unmistakablecreative.com. Um, really looking forward to the MEM course. And thank you again, Srini, for your wonderful webinar. All right. Thanks a lot, everybody.